Okay, welcome to Wednesday, March 17, St. Patrick's Day. And this is Math 208, our class session recording. And we are working on hypothesis testing this week. <coughs> Excuse me. So I will give you two examples of performing hypothesis tests using examples out of the book. And these two examples right here are going to be very close to the current homework you're working on. Uh, I'll say a word before we get started. And you submitted a homework last night, or as this recording is live, you submitted a homework on Tuesday, March 16. So I'm reading those, and then I'm updating your ALTA scores and reading those, and then I'll generate grade reports for you later this week, since we passed a landmark in the ALTA sections as well. So by now you should be about 17 assignments completed in the ALTA sections. I also want to point out, let's go to our website that you have a test coming up roughly two weeks from now. So let me share that screen with you and we're looking at our website. We're in week 10 right now. But if you look forward, one more week, next week we'll do some more hypothesis testing. And then we have an exam that covers chapters six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 after the first exam left off. So we'll release that exam here in week 12 and it will be due one week later on April 6. Remember, if you want to know the dates of any of our assignments on the resources page, assessments, you have the recommended dates for all ALTA homework assignments. You have the written homeworks and their solutions for every date. And then you have the dates of the exams. So you're going to work on a homework for next Tuesday, one more homework. But then during the week that you're doing the exam, you are not doing a homework. It's kind of like the exam is a larger homework, but I don't make you do exam and homework in the same week. Okay, so that just peek ahead. Today we open up chapter one and next week we fit chapter 10, excuse me, next week we finish chapter 10. And then in the week after that, you'll be working on an exam. Okay, so scan the website, keep track of those dates. Okay, I'm also gonna erase my calculator screen here. So that's ready to go when we want it. Okay, that's good. So we're gonna do two flavors of hypothesis tests today. And these are both problems out of your book. And I picked examples out of the book so you could also read how the author presented the answer. And they presented it correctly, but I think sometimes when you're writing the book, you don't write down every detail. So I want to do these two problems for you in a little bit more detail than the book did them, just so you can be sure that you understand what the author is saying. You be sure that you can perform the tests yourself. Now these tests use various examples of our distributions. And so one of your challenges is knowing when you perform a test, which distribution will you use? And we'll talk about that in our examples today, but don't neglect the power of drawing a picture of the distribution you're using. And sometimes I think the author is a little bit casual when she draws the distribution curves. So I want to show you how I want you to be a little more exact in that. Okay, let us get started. Let's look at these two examples. And of course, if you have any other question you'd like to ask, you can also bring that up. 
uh, first example, second example. The second example's got some intense calculation in it and then we can use the calculator to back us up. Both of these tests that we're gonna do in these examples, the calculator can perform the test fully and you can use the calculator's performance of the test to check your own and the author tells you how to do that. But you also want to be able to perform the test by yourself. So let's look at these two examples. And I wanna to try to pace myself so that I don't spend over much time on one example and then give short time to the other example. So let me try to be careful about that. So example 9.21, let me open up the book in front of you so you can see what that is. We'll read it and then we can switch back to it if we need to pick up some more information. Let me find my screen with my book and I'm looking at the book here, but I'm paging through till I find example 9.21. So I don't wanna make you dizzy, but sorry about that. Oh, you know what I could do to make that easier is just go to section 9.5 where the example is. Okay. Example 9.16, example 9.17, I pick example 9.21 because I know you've probably heard of something like this. Here we are. And let me see if I can make that slightly larger for you. See how it appears on your screen. Okay. You've heard this case before. People claim or are concerned that cell phone usage could be related to rate of brain cancer. You know, cell phone is putting out electromagnetic waves. Does that affect your health? Because you're holding the cell phone up to your ear. Now, uh, a, a more new claim as they roll out 5G networks, and I'm not a technical person, so I can't tell you exactly what a 5G network is, but a 5G network is a more, a definitely more intense radio wave. So people have renewed this claim with the 5G networks. Oh yeah, cell phones can give you cancer. Oh, 5G networks are gonna give you cancer. And I know I'm not saying this to give any credence to anything, but you've even heard probably somebody's rumor somewhere that 5G networks are related to the coronavirus. Now, I have absolutely zero belief in that. But I want to point this out to you because this is the kind of thing people can say all day, right? How do you test that idea? How do you have a conversation with a person who's telling you that cell phones giving you brain cancer, or the 5G networks is giving you cancer, or the coronavirus. In the end, since I'm not a doctor, and I probably can't convince people that have some of those beliefs, regardless of whether I'm a doctor or not, I don't know how successful I'm going to be helping people evaluate that. But I can be responsible for myself and you can be responsible for yourself and you can look at the evidence and make your own decision. I'll let you make your own decision about what you believe about this, but at least let me show you some statistical evidence. Okay, so that's the setup. In a study of 420,000 cell phone users, 172 of the people develop brain cancer. Okay, are we concerned about that? Let's test this claim that the cell phone users developed brain cancer at a greater rate than non-cell phone users. Remember, because brain cancer can exist 
in our environment with or without cell phones. So it says that the rate of brain cancer for non-cell phone users is 0.0340%. Now pay attention, that doesn't say 3.4%. That says 3.41 hundredths of 1%. So not even one in a hundred, not even one in a thousand, 3.4 people in 10,000 ordinarily develop brain cancer. It's relatively rare, thankfully. What about this 172 people out of 420,000? I'll pop to my calculator for a second. Excuse me, find my calculator. Here's my calculator. And we're looking at my calculator just casually. What is 172 divided by 420,000 and 19? Now check this out. This is 4.09 times 10 to the negative fourth. Now this is a little bit awkward. So how can I write this in a form where I don't Express times 10 to the negative fourth. Actually, this is a little bit higher than the general rate of the population. So let me write this in, not scientific notation, but let's see if we can write this as a long decimal. No, it's not gonna help me right there. I guess on my paper, I need to show you or I can type it in the calculator here. This is zero, zero, four, sorry, 0 0.00, zero, 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 four, zero, nine. <sighs> sorry, I have trouble typing this in from my keyboard and from the calculator. 0 0.00040959. O oh, five two eight. I just want to show you how many zeros is in that number. If I hit enter here, you see that's the same number. <coughs> and here's the general rate of brain cancer in society. I pull this up out of the book. Three point four one hundredths of one percent. So that's zero three divided by a hundred. Zero point zero three four percent so divided by one hundred. And you compare that number to the number we just had. Now again, got the 10 to the minus fourth here. So without the scientific notation, that would be 0 0.0003400 and more zeros after that. And you see that the rate of cancer in this study was one in 10, one in 100, one in 1000. No, four in 10,000. And the rate of cancer in the general population tens, hundreds, thousands, three in 10,000. So now you start to wonder, oh my goodness, the rate of cancer among the cell phone users was higher. But the question is, is it significantly higher? How much higher than what I would expect from ordinary randomness? And that's why we're gonna perform the hypothesis test. Okay, so let's switch to our paper. And you also have this problem worked out in the book. On the same page I was showing you, but I'm gonna write it down on the paper here so I can go through every step with you. Okay, let's go back to my paper. 
So we have a study of 420,019 people. And in that study, a certain number of them, 172 developed brain cancer. We studied, we studied 420,000 people, a little more, cell phone users, of course. And we want to know if cell phone users have brain cancer at a higher rate than the ordinary population. This proportion, this X divided by N, this 172, divided by 420,019. Sure, it's very small, but maybe it's more brain cancer than we ordinarily have. Okay, so what is this number? We popped it into our calculator. We got 0 0.0004095. And remember how to read that. This is tenths, hundreds, thousands. So this is about four people in 10,000. But the ordinary rate of brain cancer for non cell phone users is slightly less. Now you're asking, where did they get non cell phone users? Because it seems like Pretty much everybody's got a cell phone now. Well, we do have many, many, many records from before the time cell phone, right? And I cannot tell you like, when was the first cell phone or when was it widely adopted? But we could look up records. We do have brain cancer rates from many years in the past where people didn't ordinarily use cell phone. That ordinary rate, that ordinary proportion is about 0 0.0340 percent. To trade that into a number, I divide by 100, which means I put two more zeros in there. 0 0.0003400. Now I'm comparing these two numbers. And you can see why someone might get alarmed. They say, oh my goodness, when you use a cell phone, you have more cancer. Well, we do have more cancer. I can't deny that. But I also have things like random variation that happen too, right? Let me number my paper so we can move on. So I want to know if this extra cases of cancer here equate to just some random variation. What is 0 0.03400% of 420,000? Let's say if I had 420,019 people ordinarily, multiply by this number, and that'll tell you how many people you'd ordinarily expect to have cancer. I'll do that on my calculator off screen. That turns out to be about 142 out of 420,019. Now, how should you compare that 142 to that 172? Wow, 30 more people got brain cancer. Yeah, but 30 more people and nearly half a million. How do I know something else isn't causing a slight increase in brain cancer rate. So I want to perform a test. Let's test to see if this increase 
is significant. And the moment someone says significance, then we have to set a level of significance. In the example that the book provides, they give us the level of significance as alpha equals 0 0.01. So I want to know if I took 99, if I took 100 random samples, would 99 of them allow for this much variation? I want it to be the variation to be so rare that it would show up in less than 1% of the samples. This is the level of significance, the error that I'm going to allow. And let's set up what we call in the section the hypothesis test. We're going to let the null hypothesis, let's say our base assumption is that there's no change between these populations. That's called the null hypothesis. That the cancer rate in the general population is not less than the cancer rate that I observed in my sample. So I'm gonna say that cell phone users do not have it worse off than non-cell phone users. But I'm suspicious, aren't I? Let's make our alternative hypothesis. Now the book, when he writes alternative hypothesis, writes H sub A. I'm gonna, my problem is that A's and zeros look alike. So I'm gonna write H sub one for the alternative hypothesis. And my alternative hypothesis will be, wait a minute, I'm nervous that the rate of cancer in this population is greater than the ordinary 0 0.00034. Let me rewrite that nicely. My regular hypothesis is that the cancer rates are no worse than 0 0.00034, no worse than 0.034%. But I'm nervous that cell phone users might have a higher cancer rate. And this is called my alternative hypothesis. So I want to know how likely is it that the proportion of the population that uses cell phones has a higher cancer rate than the ordinary population. Now, I've got to check some assumptions. I'm assuming that cancer occurs in a regular population and in the cell phone using population at standard normal distribution. You know, lots of cases here, fewer cases here. Most people, the average is around that 0.00034%. So I'm assuming these populations are normally distributed. The book also gives a couple of other things you have to check in this case. You have to check that the number of people you sample times the probability is 
not a trivially small number. So the book sets a threshold at five, but the number of people I sampled times the proportion that I saw in this problem was 172. In other words, I saw 172 cases of cancer. And that means how many cases did not have cancer? If P is the probability of cancer, let's say Q is the probability of not having cancer. That means 419, 847 people did not have cancer. These two numbers add up to N. I also want to know that the number of people I'm sampling is less than 5% of the population overall. Because I'm conducting a simple random sample, I don't want to select the same person twice. So let's think about this. If I have 420,000 people I've sampled, and what's the average number, what's the number of cell phone users in the United States? And, and you could look this up. This is on the order of 300 million, 250 million. Let's say, now let's, let's be very conservative. 330 million people in the United States. Let's say of those 330 million people, Two hundred million are cell phone users. And you can see that I'm easily less than five percent of two hundred million. Ten percent of two hundred million is twenty million. Half of that is ten million. Five percent of two hundred million is ten million people. So I do this check to make sure that I'm not selecting people accidentally twice when I do my study. The book does not mention this, but that's an important consideration when you do such a test. Okay, now I'm ready to perform the test. And I'm thinking about the distribution in this case as a standard normal distribution. And I'm not going to be excellent at drawing this, but I can have a computer draw this in a second. Let's do this normal bell-shaped curve, where the average is 0 0.00034. And I've noticed my cancer rate at being higher than that. My P prime is 0 0.0004095. I want to know if I draw that number on this curve, how many people are captured by that? Is that a large percent of this normal curve? If it is, then this is relatively likely to happen by random chance. But if this 4095 is just a tiny, tiny portion of the curve out here, then this 4095 is unlikely to happen randomly by chance. And maybe cell phone users do have cancer at a higher rate. Now I have to think about my standard deviation here so I can set some scale. So we're using a distribution. It's a normal distribution with a mean of 0 0.00034 0 .00034 and a standard deviation of P times Q divided by N. In this problem, that is 0 0.00034 and a standard deviation of 0 
three, four, times Q is one minus that. So 0 0.99966. I wrote that a little bit too small, excuse me. Divided by the number of people sampled, 420,000. and 19. This is gonna be an extremely small number. I'll just bring this up on my calculator. I'll switch to screen calculator in a second. But what is the square root of 0 0.00034 times 0 0.99966 divided by 420,019? You get the right number of zeros in there. That's 2.84466 number there times 10 to the negative fifth. I'll remind you how to switch this. 2.8447, if I round off, times 10 to the negative fifth. That means I'm moving that decimal place five times to the left. So zero, 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 four zeros then a two, eight, four, four, seven. That's my standard deviation. Now, there's so many zeros right here, right? So how does that compare to the 34? I got four zeros right there. So that two shows up there. So one standard deviation would be here at 0 0.0003 two-ish, two standard deviations would be over here at 0.00030-ish. Not exactly because of the other digits here, right? But as I count off standard deviations, by the time I get to, sorry, I got to add 37, 39. By the time I get to 4.0 over here, I do have a relatively small part of the curve. So the question is, how does that compare? How does that area there compare? Is that area greater than? Or 0 0.01 or less than or 0 0.01? So let's draw this on the calculator screen and see what these areas look like. You can draw it on a calculator screen or Desmos. Maybe I'll take Desmos here first and then we'll reproduce it on the calculator screen. I do it on Desmos because I can write more things on that Desmos screen. Let's go to a web browser and let's open up the web browser. And let's look at this Desmos graphic. Let's create some graphic, a normal distribution. So you go to the keyboard in the lower left-hand corner, keypad, pick functions, distributions, and here's a normal distribution. And Desmos says, tell me what your mean is. Tell me what your standard deviation is. Our mean was 0 0.00034. Our standard deviation was 0 0.00028447. Let's see what the graph looks like. This graph looks crazily, crazily small, right? Well, that's because I've got to find the right scale. So I've got to be around 34 here. And my paper says around from 34 to 40. Let's set this x-axis from 0 to 0 0.00042.
Okay, I've got some kind of thing here, but it's going way, way too high. So I'm going to have to set up some kind of width. Remember, the area under here is one. So such a tiny interval here, the area being one, I'm going to have to go up very high on the y-axis. How about 100? That's not high enough. 1,000, not high enough. So I can see the curve right here, right? Let's try 10,000. No, oh, I'm getting within reach. Let's try 100,000. OK, that made the curve way too small, uh, but I can still use it. Let's compromise and say 20,000 is the height of that curve. I can test a little bit quicker here in Desmos. And let's run this from minus 10,000 to 20,000 just to give myself some perspective. There we go. So there's a normal distribution. And my mean is right here at 34. 34 100 thousandths, 3.4 10 thousandths. But where is the 4095 if I shade that? So let's shade the cumulative distribution function. Let's shade it from 0 0.000 4095 all the way up to infinity. Look at the area that does most reports to me 0 0.00728. How does that compare to our 0 0.01? That's going to be larger. Let me shade an area that's 0 0.01 on this graph. I'll go back to the normal distribution functions and do the inverse distribution. right here, inverse cumulative distribution function. Let's give this graph a name so I can refer to it. And then say, give me the place where this distribution has an area of 0 0.01 to the right, or 0 0.99 to the left. That says triple zero four oh six. Remember, our cancer rate was triple zero four oh nine. So our cancer rate is to the right of this cancer rate. Let's shade this on this distribution right here. So I'm gonna take the same normal distribution, copy and paste. And I'm gonna make that red and dotted line or dotted line. So I'm not on top of that other one. And then let's shade from this number, 406177 on up. 0.0004064177. That's probably more digits than I need. And now let's look closely at this graph. The pink portion is what I allowed for my error. And the blue portion is my sample. And you see that the area in my sample, the probability of my sample being significant is smaller than the threshold of level significance that I set. These things are so small that it's hard to see. Let me zoom in on that space right there. The probability, even though I had higher cancer rates in my sample, the probability of that being significant, that's going to happen less than one in a hundred times. 
So 99 times out of 100, my sample says, this is unusual. This is not significant. So what do I have to do with this problem? My P prime sample is pretty rare. It's kind of unusual that I got such a high sample right there. So I'm going to go back to my paper and go back to my hypothesis test. Stop sharing, go back to my paper. I believed that the rate of cancer should be in line with the general population. And even though my sample had a slightly higher cancer rate than the general population, the probability of that was less than the level of significance. So I'm going to say that this event was relatively rare and I have no significant evidence Let me write this neatly on the paper. I have no significant evidence at the alpha equals 0 0.01 level of significance that cancer rates are higher among cell phone users. In other words, the extra cases that I've seen in my sample are more likely due to random chance than cell phone usage. So what's my conclusion? I do not reject the null hypothesis. I have no significant evidence that cancer rates are higher among cell phone users. Now you, first time you see something like this, it does bother people, it's a little can be confusing because you say, but you did have more cancer cases than the regular population. Yes, but not so much more that it cannot be due to random chance. And that's what this drawing represents. And that's what the drawing on Desmos represents. My sample is in the blue portion, and that represents a less than one in 100 chance of being significantly higher than the general population. And that one in 100 chance is represented by this pink area. The blue area is my sample, and the pink area was this one in 100 chance of being significant. I'm not saying that nicely. I should just stick to the ordinary sentence. 
there's no significant evidence that cancer rates are higher among cell phone users. than among the general population. Now, I, I wanna warn you about some things. There's probably things we don't know about brain cancer and things we don't know about cell phone usage, right? So there might be other medical reasons that I observed that's slightly higher than average brain cancer rate. There might be something else in the environment besides the cell phones that's causing brain cancer rates today to be greater than they were when the non-cell phone user brain cancer rates were reported, right? So just because I can't show the significant evidence that does not mean I have proved that cell phones don't cause brain cancer. And it doesn't mean that I've proved that there is something else in the environment causing increase in brain cancer. All I've done right here is it say, within the laws of random chance, this extra number of brain cancer cases among those cell phone users surveyed is not unusual. Okay, that is the nature of the hypothesis test. And in this case, that proportion of people I observed is a very small part of the expected distribution. Let's do another example. So not doing bad for time, but I'm using a little more time than I expected. Let's go to example 10.2. This is a hypothesis test with two populations, not one population, is a hypothesis test of two population means. This is something you often want to do. Uh, if your book gives you several examples, like you put two groups of people on a diet and you want to compare one diet to another diet. And both people's groups lost weight. And you can record the average amount of weight lost in the two groups. And you can record the standard deviation of the weight loss among the two groups. But can you tell that one diet was better than the other at producing weight loss? Or maybe if the differences in weight loss one group lost an average of nine pounds, the other group lost an average of 10 pounds. Maybe that difference in the average amount of weight loss is just due to random chance. So let's take a particular example out of the book right here. This is example 10.2. And it describes a situation not of weight loss, but students taking math classes at two colleges. Let's say I have two colleges. Let's call them College A and College B. And I think students at one college take more math classes than students at the other college. Why do I think that? I sampled a certain number of people at each college. Let's say I randomly sampled 11 students at this college and nine students at that college. That's not a very large sample in either case. But of the 11 students I sampled, the average number of math classes, the mean was 4.0 from college A 
and 3.5 from college B. So it's like last time with the cell phone users, you might jump to the conclusion, aha, at college A, they take more math classes. But remember, this is a random sample. So maybe I just accidentally picked people who took more math classes, right? The difference here is not large. So how do I know whether people at college A actually take more math classes? In my samples, let's say the standard deviation was 1.5 at college A and 1.0 at college B. So just to label each one of these columns, this first column is the sample size. Second column was the sample mean. And this third column was the sample standard deviation. So I'd like to ask this question. Do students at college A take more math classes on average, I'm looking at the average, than students at college B. Remember, I wanna perform a statistical test so that I don't jump to conclusions. I can't just sample a handful of people and say, yep, college A, they take more math classes. I may have sampled the wrong people. My sample size is not very large. Why don't I just go ask every student at College A and every student at College B? Well, Delta College, every student at Delta College would be, you know, enrollment comes and goes, but that would be about right now, 7,000 people. So you got the time to go ask in 7,000 people? I'm not so sure. Talk about MSU, University of Michigan. 40 to 50,000 students. Central Michigan University, 15 to 20,000 students. You would like to ask them all, but that costs a lot of time and money. Can I do something with this small sample right here? Can I do a hypothesis test with this sample? Now remember, it's not going to prove anything, but I could have a certain level of confidence in my conclusion. So let's set the standard here. Let's set the level of confidence. The book, when I did this problem, the book said, we'll set the level of confidence at uh, 1% again. Or level of confidence. at 99%, which means that alpha, the error, is about 1%. That's the same error I set on the cell phone users. That's a pretty small error, one in 100, right? When I'm looking at brain cancer in cell phone users, I think I want to be pretty darn accurate. Yeah? Maybe when I'm looking at this case right here, of just sampling the college students, I'd be happy being 95% accurate or 95% level of confidence. Maybe I'd be happy with a 90% level of confidence. But I'm gonna go with the book. 
let's set the level of confidence at 99%. Let's set the probability. Remember, this is the probability of type 1 error at 1%. Let's define our two hypotheses. So first I got college A and college B. So let's say, and I do not know what the mean is between these two. So let's say the mean number of classes, math classes that people take at college A is no better than the mean number of math classes people take at college B. When I use that less than or equal to sign, what am I saying? The average number of math classes at college A is not more than the average number of math classes taken at college B. But what's my alternative hypothesis? I took this sample and I got a higher average at college A. So I'm suspicious, just like the cell phone users, I'm suspicious that the average number of math classes at college A is bigger than the average number of math classes at college B. So what is our hypothesis in English? The average number of math classes taken to college A is not more than at college B. If I want to make the claim that it is more, if I want to make the claim that this is more, then I'm gonna to have to bring some significant evidence. This is my null hypothesis. This is my alternative hypothesis. I'm suspicious. Maybe the average number of math classes is more. What's the alternative hypothesis? It would be the opposite of the null hypothesis or it'd be the other case of the null hypothesis. My alternative hypothesis is the average number of math classes at college A is more than at college B. Now this is a different test that I got to perform right here because it's a test of populations. In the last example with the cell phone users, I was talking about population proportion. Here I'm talking about population averages, population means. So I have to perform a different test here. And I do not know what the standard deviation is for these two populations, college A and college B. I know what the standard deviation is for the samples. We have the standard deviations of the samples, but not the whole populations. What does this mean? We have to perform a t-test. Or if I don't know the standard deviation of the population, I need to use the t-distribution.
But how do I perform a t-test when I have two sample means and two sample standard deviations? How do I average these into one standard deviation? How do I create one test statistic? So in this chapter, section 10.1, they show you how to create the estimated standard deviation for the distribution of the differences for the distribution of the difference. Sorry, I gotta slide my paper up. Between the mean at college A and the mean at college B. So our random variable our distribution is going to be the mean of the samples at college A, the mean of the samples at college B, the difference between those two. And to create a standard deviation for that distribution, I'm going to have to average the two standard deviations from my sample in a funny way. And the book gives us formula. We can add this to our formula sheet. It says, take the square of standard deviation for college A divided by the size of the sample from college A plus the square of the standard deviation of college B divided by the sample size of college B. Remember square of standard deviation is called variance. We don't use that word a lot, but we'll use it more in the future. And this will be the sample standard deviation for this distribution of differences. So think about my null hypothesis. I'm saying that I suspect the average of college A is bigger than the average of college B. I'm suspecting that this number is gonna have a positive mean. And my null hypothesis says the average at A is no more than the average of B that this is either zero or less. So I need to know how rare my sample is. My sample says the average of college A was more for these 11 people. Now we gotta take these numbers and insert them into this formula. And I'm gonna need a calculator to do this, but I'll just write down the standard deviation of college A was 1.5. Number of people sampled 11. Standard deviation at college B, 1.0. Number of people sampled was nine. I'm not gonna try to work this out. I'll work it out on my calculator off screen. I'm not gonna try to estimate it because there's too many pieces in there to think about easily. So let me type this into my calculator and then I'll show you what I get as a result. So that's what it looks like, sorry. That's what it looks like typed in my calculator. I got 0 0.561833. Now how many decimal places to use right there? You're always 
thinking about that, but let's say five, six, one, eight. Let's round off to four decimal places. Okay, so that's my estimate of the standard deviation between the difference of these two means. Now, what's the test statistic I'm gonna use for my T distribution? I gotta keep numbering these pages, excuse me. Here's page four. The statistic that I'm going to test, the place where I'm going to look at the area under the T distribution, the T score is going to be formally written like this, but we'll fill in the blanks. The mean at college A minus the mean at college B. And the difference between that and the true average of college A and the true average of college B divided by this estimated standard deviation that we created a second ago in the calculator. Now, in this case, if there's no difference between the means at the colleges, this piece is going to be zero. So that's what I'm testing. And here, I can take the difference between the two averages that I found from my sample. So if you let me fill this in, this would be 4.0 classes on average at college A, 3.5 classes on average at college B, I have to assume right now there's no difference between college A and college B. I have to prove otherwise or bring you evidence otherwise. And then this number in here, we've already filled out. In fact, we've already calculated, but I'll just fill in the standard deviations and the sample sizes just so you see it again. When I type this into my calculator, what do I have? just 4.0 minus 3.5 divided by that number up top. I could just grab that whole square root up top and have it show up down here and then calculate this number. 8899, let's just take the four decimal places, 0 0.8899. Okay, so now let's look at the T distribution. But wait a minute, T distribution depends on the sample size, the degrees of freedom. right? Which is n minus one, sample size minus one. But which sample size should I choose? Oh, let me get my paper back over here. Remember, I took a sample of 11 people from college eight, nine people from college B. Should I use the 11? Should I use the nine? Should I add them up and use a 20? Now these are relatively the same size, right? So actually saying, adding these up and saying my total sample size is 20 and my degrees of freedom is 19 is actually not far from a good estimate. But what happens if these two sample sizes are different, significantly different, how do I weight them? So the book gives you a formula for weighting these, for creating the degrees of freedom in this extra case. 
and I'll write down the formula, which is a horrible mess. And then we'll calculate it for our particular problem. But it turns out to be very close to 19. It turns out to be very close to 20 divided by one. So the degrees of freedom is the sample size of college A squared divided by the sample of college A size, sample or the standard deviation of college B squared, S is for standard deviation, divided by the sample size of college B, and then square that. And in the bottom, it's gonna get ugly. So I'm gonna leave some space here. Standard deviation of college A squared divided by the sample of college A, likewise for college B. But on top of that, I'm gonna weight these two, one over sample size minus one at college A and one over sample size at college B minus one. Okay, this is a horrible, horrible number to compute. There's no way I'm gonna do this without a calculator, but I'll at least fill in the blanks so you can see the numbers that I would use right here, right? All from the samples that I took. 1.5 squared over 11, square that. Sorry, don't square that. Square after I add 1.0 squared over nine. Okay, so those two things added together squared, divided by, now remember sample size A was 11, so one tenth of 1.5 squared over 11 plus one eighth, sample size was nine at college B, 1.0 squared over nine. Absolutely crazy number. Now your calculator, you could type this in by yourself and that would be a lot of work. Your calculator will actually calculate this number for you under the sample test that she demonstrates in the book. But I would like to actually calculate this number for you just so you can see what's going on. And it's not too hard to produce on your calculator screen. I've already typed in this number, right? With the square root. Let me grab that down here and then go to the front of this number and erase the square root with a delete key. Now I'll insert parentheses before and after that expression. You can hop to the beginning or the end of expression by hitting the blue key and the arrow key. Now I'll square this. Now I'm gonna divide by and I'm going to add a lot, a lot of parentheses, one tenth times that 1.5 squared over 11. Sorry, 1.5 squared over 11. So I'm going to have to insert a one there. plus one eighth, let's use parentheses properly just so you can see the pieces, one eighth times 1.0 squared over nine. I'm not recommending you type this in each time. And, oh, sorry, I gotta square each one of these besides that. That makes it even more work. So I'll show you the screen later where the calculator will do this automatically for you. But if I do this all properly, insert square right there. I hope I have this all from left to right. Okay, got those two terms there summed and squared, and then one tenth of the first term squared plus one eighth of the second term squared. Okay, I'm just reading this carefully as I go by. What's that number? I don't like that. 
I have missed something there. Oh, I missed the dividing sign between the numerator and denominator. So let's try it again. I got to go right here and insert a dividing. This was the numerator, this was the denominator. I guess I'm demonstrating why you don't want to do this by hand. Okay, let's try it again. 17.3978. <coughs> was I going to do 20 minus 1, say degrees of freedom was 19? In this two population test, it's more accurate to use this number, 17.3978, as our degrees of freedom. Are you allowed to use a decimal number as degree of freedom? Yes, you are, if you, you're going to enter this into the calculator. And some people round this off and call this 18. But I can use this whole number inside the calculator. So let me show you where that is on your calculator. I'm going to get the calculator screen clear. And then I'll share the screen with you and we'll draw the picture together. And that'll be the last thing we do, unfortunately, because we're using up our time. So let's go to draw a T distribution. So ordinary T probability distribution function. Let's put that right here. Number five. Use the variable x for the function. And degrees of freedom, I can type in this 17.3978. And paste. And now I'll draw this. Let's look at the window. A good window here, well, first of all, I'll draw it and show you a bad window. This would be a bad window, but the T distribution is centered at zero. So let's just say I didn't know any better and I picked a standard window. Okay, there's a little bump there. <coughs> I think I should be going between minus two to two. Let's try that. Sorry. I have to use the minus key on the bottom. Okay, a little wider bump, but not very high. I don't think this thing is going to get above one, right? So let's change that window to y scale, y min minus one. Y max, I keep using, I keep using the subtraction key instead of the minus key on the bottom of the keyboard because my fingers are on the computer keyboard. So let's go from minus one to one and let's count every one tenth. Now we graph. There's the T distribution. I could tighten that up. Even better, how about minus three to three? Just so that looks a little tighter. Not as low as minus one. How about minus 0 0.1? Now graph. Okay, that looks a little bit easier to look at. Now, what was my test statistic? My test statistic on my paper, and I could hop back to my paper for a second, was 0.8899. I want to see what proportion of that distribution is shaded above 0.8899. So I'll go back to my thing. Now, this is, look at the window. X scale counting by ones, right? So this is one, 0.899 is just to the left of that. And that's pretty large size. 
this looks like it is not rare. That's taken a pretty large grip of this distribution, pretty large size of the distribution. But let's shade it, and then I'll show you how the calculator does the test. Let's shade that area from 0 0.8899 all the way up to the left side of the screen, which was 3. Look at that, the probability is nearly 20%. I'll write that on the paper. The probability, the p-value, the probability value is 0 0.188, well, 1889, if you round off to four digits. But what was my level of error, 0 0.01. This is far greater than 0 0.01. I did see more classes, math classes taken on average at college A at college B, but by ordinary probability, that's well within random chance. So my p-value, my probability value, is greater than my alpha. That slightly higher average of math class at college B could just be due to random chance. So on my paper here, I'm going to write I cannot conclude that people at college A take more math classes. I cannot reject the null hypothesis or in English, there is no significant evidence that students at college A take more math classes than students at college B. And again, you're saying, but your samples said they took more. Yeah, the sample said they took more, but not so much more that it couldn't have been by random chance. Remember, I was setting that random chance right there at 1% level of significance. But even if I set it at 5% or 10% level of significance, my samples have not proved anything. Now, you don't play with the level of significance after you do the sampling. But I set a high bar here. I want it to be very, very sure, just like the cell phone cancer rates. And my probability value here says what? No, no. This could have been simply due to random chance. You had a one in five chance of making the difference that great. You haven't proved anything. Now I want to show you before we go, because we do have to cut this off. I'm sorry, I'm taking so long, that I could perform this test on the calculator like this. Under statistics tests, I could use a two sample T test, number four. If you want to check your work but then you have to input the data yourself. The first sample mean was four. The first sample standard deviation, college A was 1.5. And you surveyed 11 people at college 1.5. Second sample mean 3.5. Second sample standard deviation 1.0. And you sampled nine people at college B. What kind of test do you want that College A was bigger than college B. That's what you were guessing. 
And pooled here, we're going to leave as NOVA right now. That's a fancier way of averaging the standard deviations, the variances. So first, I could calculate this probability. And notice the calculator says the probability, the p-value was 1.92815. The degrees of freedom, 173978. OK, now the calculator is not rounding off as we rounded off on our way to that. So these are approximately the same values. The test statistic, 8899, same as mine. So what I could do is have the calculator draw this now. Stats, calculator test, number four. I've got all the same numbers there. Let's let the calculator draw this for me. And it'll draw the portion that it wants to shade here. First, this was my distribution. Calculator says, yeah, I got the same distribution. The calculator says, yeah, that probability was 88.99%. And that's a pretty large chance. This could have happened. This difference that you observed could have just been by random chance. If I was to shade 1% of this under B, I'm not sure exactly where to put that number, but we could look it up. Let's say I want to shade this calculate and I want to shade number seven and I want to put this about where one percent of this is and I looked up ahead of time that'd be about 2.56 2.57 too much let's say 2.56 one was more accurate and let's go all the way out the door to five. One, two, three, four, five. See that blue part is about 1%. But this part right here was much more than 1%, nearly 19%. This difference I observed was quite possibly due to random chance. So I have no right to conclude that people at College A take more math classes than people at College B. Okay, those are two quick examples of hypothesis tests. You have to practice these. Sorry, I think I wasn't sharing that computer screen nicely with you. I just shaded that test from the two sample t-test here. I used all the values I put in and just told the calculator to draw it. And then the calculator drew the T distribution that I had already typed in the calculator. Then the calculator is reproducing that T distribution for me in magenta. That's the same area that I had there. And the area that represents 1% is about on the blue curve from 2.5 five, six, one to the right-hand side of the screen, which is five. See that little blue sliver represents 1%, 1 percent, 1 percent chance. And I'm well above that. Okay, you have to perform these tests yourself and get in the swing of things. These formulas for the degrees of freedom are kind of cumbersome. Remember, it's built into your calculator in the sample test, and you can type these in carefully to your calculator too to confirm. But I'm gonna to have to cut it off there because I overdid it on time, I apologize, but you can consume this recording again at your own pace. So I will see you again next week. This problem is very much like the second homework problem you're doing. So you can use this as a model for the second homework problem you're doing this week. So you guys have a good weekend and we'll see you next week.